Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWANTTOGARDEN.COM and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWANTTOGARDEN.COM. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Dr. Laura Kelly to talk about healthy bones through whole foods. Laura practices medicine based on principles of nature using nutrients and natural medicines. This approach to primary care combines functional medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, and tools for Western medicine to build a complete picture of the body and a plan for how to guide and assist in its return to health. Laura consults with patients in multiple countries and is based in Topanga, California. Her book, The Healthy Bones Nutrition Plan and Cookbook, is published by Chelsea Green, which she co-wrote with her mother, Helen Bryman Kelly. Welcome to the show today, Laura. Hi, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, I'm glad to have you talking about health. That is always a good thing. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Sure. I sort of trained as an artist and was very happy sort of exploring the creative side of myself, Mm -hmm. but I felt like I needed to have a a larger spectrum of work in a different direction. And I I have a lot of uh, doctors in my family on both sides, Uh uh, traditional Western Western doctors, Mm -hmm. and we'd we'd never been alternative in my family. That wasn't something that happened. But as I started to realize that I really just wanted to be in medicine, I, saw, I, I signed up for a pre-med program, a little late, but I did that. And as I started to go down that path, I realized that I really wanted to help people be well, not only fix them after they were sick. Mm. And the, the, the system that I was in didn't cater to that, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so I thought, well... There must be other ways of doing medicine that, that can actually work with people right through, throughout their lives while they're well. Mm-hmm. So I started looking around and I explored a couple of you know Ayurvedic and sort of various alternative medical forms. And the one that resonated with me the most was this the Chinese medical philosophy, because it's based in a Taoist right. uh, approach yep. to life and mm-hmm. to medicine and to health. And there's this concept of uh, of you know. The, us being one with the, the earth mm-hmm. and sharing the properties and helping in a symbiotic relationship with the plants and the animals and all of us being t- together and working together as a system. Right. And that made sense to me in, in, intuitively. And I said, okay, well, this is actually, <laughs> so, this is actually what I think I might want to, how I want to approach medicine. So I st- started studying Chinese medicine and it was a big departure from what I was doing, but it was the right thing to do for me. Nice. And so this is my entree into approaching the body mm-hmm. and how it fits not only the, the, the system of the body itself, but how that system fits into the larger system that we live in. Nice. So your book, 
And that's going to be a big topic of discussion today. I have a copy of it sitting here right in front of me. So if you hear me madly flipping pages, it's because I'm consuming part of it and trying to, you know, direct the conversation. So your book is The Healthy Bones Nutrition Plan and Cookbook, How to Prepare and Combine Whole Foods to Prevent and Treat Osteoporosis Naturally. So let's start with, what is osteoporosis? Uh, osteoporosis is when your bone, as generally speaking, as you age, mm-hmm. um, you your bones will thin, and ah. for a lot of a lot of the bone turnover, the the process of bone turnover is related to hormones, especially estrogen. So as women age and they start to lose estrogen, a lot of that bone turnover slows down. Mm-hmm. So generally speaking, in the normal population, if we had really great nutrition, all of us, uh-huh. we would have some bone density loss, but it wouldn't be enough to be dangerous. And osteoporosis is when your bones are thin enough to potentially break and fracture. And that, that can be a big problem for older people, especially a lot of hip fractures are correlated oh, yes. with dying. So if you fracture your hip, you have a much higher chance of just of dying. So right. it's a problem. The fracture is really the problem of the osteoporosis. Yeah. So jumping in to how to repair this, you, you mentioned something called great nutrition. And mm-hmm. uh, also in your book, you talk about reclaiming the term natural food. Uh, right. are, we, are we kind of in the same ballpark here with both those terms? Yes, definitely. I mean, th- not to be too mechanical about stuff, uh-huh. but... The body is a mechanism in that regard, Mm -hmm. right? We have to, every night when we go to sleep, we are generating tissue that we've damaged by living, right? If you're a long distance runner, you're going to fracture, you're going to have micro fractures in your bones, for Mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Or if you really like spicy food, you're going to sort of damage your digestive tract a little bit. And so your body has to go into repair mode in a mechanistic way and just fix the tissues that you've used. And if you don't have the right, level of nutrients for everything, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a closed and a complete system. If you don't have all of the things present that the body needs to repair the tissues or rebuild the tissues, it's not going to happen properly. So good nutrition, great nutrition is when you really have everything that this body needs in order to mm. continually rebuild itself from, from you know, the, the living experience. Yeah. That's definitely... Um, comes from natural foods. Mm-hmm. That's that's definitely the case. And this natural idea, I felt like that word had been co-opted by <laughs> anybody that wanted to sell something to somebody that knew natural was good but didn't really, you know, what are you going to do? Everybody is very confused about the diet these days because for so long we were told, eat a low-fat diet and that'll make you live longer, right? Yeah. So there are a lot of confusing things in the media and in sort of the general medical establishment that simply weren't correct. And so when they, co- when they start using that word natural, it, it just got a little confused. Mm-hmm. So I felt like I really wanted to use that word in my book because it really is what it is, right? Mm-hmm. It's a natural food. It's, it's pure as it came out of the earth, mm, right? Yeah. And the way, that, the way that, that the earth provides these things is cohesive. Say, for example, uh, you have milk, right? right? You have milk when you're when you're drinking the milk. What it has in it is it it has milk protein in it, but it also has an enzyme present in the milk itself that helps you digest that protein. Oh. So these so a lot of the things that come out of nature are built to help you work with that food information. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? Oh yes. And if you if you alter the structure of that natural form, in most cases, especially with food processing you're taking away those enzymes or the natural complements that are going to help your body work with the food product or the food. So natural to me means it's in its natural state with yeah. all of the presence of all of those pieces that help your body work with the nutrition. Yeah. I recently heard of a word from a couple of my podcast guests called foodstuffs. Are you familiar with that term? Foodstuffs? Yeah. <laughs> Is that like cheese food? Y- I mean y- food... Y- what- it, it, food it, it, yeah, it is. It's right. fa- it basically fake food masquerading as real food. 
I haven't heard that term, but I, I, I see what it is. Yeah. When, when I looked it up on, on my podcast recently, we were both giggling because it's just, it basically is fake food. So. Right. Well, there is a lot of that around. Yeah. And it doesn't really, it doesn't really benefit you. In fact, it's detrimental, generally yeah. speaking. How is it detrimental? I think your detrimental. listeners probably know. Well, I mean, it depends on what exactly is the food stuff. Mm-hmm. I can't quite generalize, but for example, a lot of the food products that you have that you're speaking about food stuffs are heated to a very high temperature. Oh, right. Um, this is par- part of the process. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of things that happen chemically when you heat a food product, a f- food, right? And it changes the chemical structure. So if you're mm-hmm. if you're using high heat on something. So when you heat the food, you're changing the chemical structure of it, and you can create damaging molecules out of changing that heat, changing the structure mm. of that food. Right. So something called like a PAH, and these these will actually interfere with your tissues. One of the things that happens, like for example, in diabetes, is you have a buildup of this glycated sugar in your tissue. Mm-hmm. That's what you're eating if you're eating highly densely processed, high heated food products. Oh. So it's the same form and it really interferes with your tissues and you mm-hmm. end up with nerve damage. <laughs> so this is, for example, if you're talking about a food stuff that's processed in high heat, this is yeah. one of the big problems. So there are different problems with different process- mm-hmm. processing ways for food, but they all end up creating more problems than they fix. Right. So in in your book, you talk how important it is to eat food in its natural forms and the, why that's essential to good health. That's kind of what we tripped upon there. Can you say more about yeah. that? Well, apart from the fact that all of these, that nature sort of provides the presence of the cofactors and the enzymes res- that will help your body deal with the food properly itself, mm-hmm. there's another piece of that puzzle, which is that you are most you are far more bacterial than you are human oh. which is really just the case there's <laughs> right. so much bacteria in our gut and that bacteria is how we digest and so we're we're not only feeding ourselves we're actually also feeding the bacteria and mm-hmm. because there's so many of them we have to feed them properly or else we don't function mm, right gut health and if you're eating foods that the bacteria are like, well, we're not going to eat that, <laughs> right? Because we don't recognize <laughs> right, that. Exactly. Then your bacteria are going to starve, literally. They're going to populations are going to die. Mm-hmm. You're going to have imbalances in your gut bacteria suddenly, and the population density is going to go down. And one thing that's for sure, even though the study of the bacteria and the gut is relatively new in medicine. Comparatively, we know for sure that density of bacterial different species in your gut equals l- healthy life. Oh. They f- you find that the lower density is population, the less types of bacteria, uh-huh. the more disease you tend to have. Ah. So if you're eating foods that the bacteria aren't going to eat, uh-huh. you're going to kill off populations. So this is another aspect of why natural foods and whole foods are so important. Because you get that biodiversity of bioflora in in your body. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Excellent. And that has to be supported. And this is eating naturally is easily the best way to do that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Your this is your first book, by the way. Congratulations. I I I know it's a magical moment when you finally get it in your hands and it's actually been printed. Um, so. Congratulations, and Chelsea Green published it, so that's always awesome. But you, yeah, thank you. Yeah, congratulations. Thanks. So you concentrate on bone health, but we haven't talked a lot about about bone health in the past fifteen minutes or so. We've been talking about nutrition. Why did you decide to focus on bone health in your first book, and how does that correlate? Well, first of all, let me just say that nutrition. The proper nutrition for bones mm-hmm. is the proper nutrition for, for everything, uh, right? Because mm-hmm. the bones are within the system of the body. They're not separate systems. So your body isn't going to have one requirement of calcium for bones and one requirement for neuron firing. Like, that would be crazy. How mm-hmm. would you maintain two separate levels of calcium in your body? You can't. So that's the first point, is that proper nutrition is proper nutrition for all things. Mm-hmm. But I chose this because my mother was suffering from osteoporosis for a long time. She had 
bone declining bone density for 18 years or 20 years. Wow. And she finally, her doctor said to her, listen, you have to take these drugs. And she said, I really don't want to take them. And she called me and I was in school and she said, what can I do? And I said, you know, I'm not exactly sure yet. I need a couple of months. So I took a fracture map of the world and looked at the countries of high fracture and the countries of low fracture and started there and started to, started to figure out what the dietary component, because it really did appear to be dietary after taking a look at that, uh -huh. of course. Of course. And so I just sort of whittled out pieces from there mm -hmm. and sort of gave her a plan. And it to, after her next DEXA scan, her bone loss had stopped completely for the first time in that 18 or 20 years. And it's been six years, I think, since then. Uh -huh. And she hasn't lost any more bone. It's, it's completely, it stops the bone loss completely. So now we're in the process of seeing if we can generate more bone density. Mm -hmm. But one thing that became really apparent in sort of looking at the way the West views bone strength mm -hmm. um, is that it isn't only about density, it's also about flexibility. Mm. And that's completely left out of the diagnosis. So we worked a lot on flexibility as well, and there is unfortunately no measurement of that. Right. But it's, if I had to choose between density and flexibility, I would actually choose flexibility for bone strength. So. Right. Wow. All this, all this because she changed the way she was eating. I just want to clarify that. Yes. Yes. Wow. That's correct. So what did that look so it's like? So it's a balance. Uh -huh. um, well, it looks like a couple of things. I mean, the way that you have to absorb calcium, for example, mm -hmm. is you have to have vitamin D present in your, in, in oh, your system for it right. to get through the intestine, mm -hmm. first of all, right? And you have to have magnesium and you have to have a vitamin called vitamin K2 to activate osteocalcin, which is a piece that tells the calcium to go into the bone. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a matter, I just traced the path of the minerals and made sure that each step along the way was had what it needs. If you're trying to build a collagen scaffold, which is what happens in the bone before the minerals and the calcium get laid on top of it. Right. You have to have col you have to have collagen, mm -hmm. but your collagen won't connect to it to the other pieces of calcium unless you have vitamin C and boron, right? So right. there are a couple of steps in, that you need to have along the way that have their own specific requirements in mm -hmm. terms of nutrition. So I just identified all of those steps and said, are you getting this and are you getting this and are they together or are they separate? Like, let's put together the plan, how the nutrients all work together uh -huh. and it works. Wow. As it should. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Your body works. So you know, when you said fracture map. When you introduced that concept of fracture map, it, it hadn't even occurred to me that we might be able to look at data like that. Uh, what were you looking for after you found the map and overlaid it on the planet? I was looking for, I mean, just starting out really basically, like where are their high fractures and where are their low fractures? Mm -hmm. Where are the highest and where are the lowest? And why, right? That's the first question you ask. Why is this whole population having a lot of fractures in this whole population not, not having a lot of fractures. Yes. That's the that's where that's where the the detective work starts. Right? Yeah, no, no kidding. And the first thing yeah, the first so the first thing that I noticed was that the highest rates of fracture are in the northern European countries like the Scandinavian countries, where they have what's called a vitamin D winter because the sun mm, is so low right. that they have almost no sunshine. Mm -hmm. So that's the very first clue and you're like, okay, well that's obviously a vitamin D issue in that situation, mm -hmm. because we, as humans, our main source of vitamin D is the sun. sun. Yep. So that's a clue immediately that this is, a, this is a dietary deficiency issue. And I really like that concept, and it's something that I've been speaking about lately, is that all of these chronic conditions that we have in the West, I mean, m more than 50% of Americans have, a chronic, have one chronic disease at least. I which know, is isn't that... Just sad. Horrific. Yeah. It's terrible. And, and, and I, ha I, I have shifted my thinking about this quite a lot. And I've kind of like, I like doing away with the concept of calling this a disease. Because when we look at these chronic conditions like osteoporosis or like diabetes or heart disease, these are actually dietary deficiencies. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's actually what they are. That is, so a, that is an that amazing, amazing thing to correlate, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And it, it, you can actually p- pull apart the pieces of how the body's functioning and go, well, okay, this, this is a disease process that comes from a dietary deficiency. Yeah. So if we can do away, I'm trying to help patients understand, because I say to them, you can work with this information that I'm helping you and providing you with, and other doctors like me are providing. Mm-hmm. And you can help, you, you can cure yourself of a lot of these problems, definitely certainly prevent them and in many cases in 90 percent of the cases sometimes you can cure it and this isn't me talking about it this is the american heart association this is the harvard's you know public health school saying that this this is a problem of diet and if you do away with the concept of disease you can't cure a disease but you can fix a deficiency so it's shifting that mindset around the sickness and i think that that's really useful oh Absolutely. Well, because then it puts the power for us to fix it back in our hands. Voila. Exactly. Yeah. It's... And the answers for these problems aren't coming from outside, uh-huh. right? There, are, there, there don't appear to be answers in the system. So I think it, it has to go this way if we're going to get better. Yeah. So luckily, we can actually do it ourselves which is really great. <laughs> that, and, you know, holding hands with nature, we can do it. Yeah, so. that's epic. That's epic. So I'm sure a lot of this you talk about in your book, right? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I think, I think a lot of this sort of came after. I mean, the book is certainly very broad spectrum in terms uh-huh. of approaching health. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think my thinking has clarified a little since then. <laughs> nice. So there, there's two parts to the book. Take charge of your bone health and cook for bone health. So obviously the second half is a, is a cookbook. Tell me about the first half. Sure. The first half is, base, is sort of basic science for the mm-hmm. layperson because what I find in my practice is that when people understand the way things work, mm-hmm. they become engaged, right? Right. So the first half of the book is explaining how your bones work on a really basic level, how bone turnover works, right? Because bone turnover... Is this, your bone is a living tissue. It's not just a. It's not like a rock, right? Yeah. It's it's constantly turning itself over and repairing itself and fixing itself on a you know every day. It's generating new bone and it's eating away at old or used or dead bone. So it's a it's a very dynamic system. The bone itself. So I think you know exp, I, explaining all of that information to people and showing them why I'm going to make the recommendations I'm making engages them in in their work that they're doing on their own bodies and that's key with if if you're trying to do this work so the first half of the book is about explaining all of this and helping people understand what's happening inside themselves Mm -hmm. and also the other factors that are involved in these kinds of illnesses because it isn't just that you don't have enough calcium like that's not really the problem you know and there can be all sorts of different other factors like inflammation can influence osteoporosis or heart disease or all of these issues. So there are various systemic factors that also could come into play. So I wanted to give people a general understanding of what all those would be as well and sort of answer as many questions as I could from the sort of medical side about what could be affecting their bodies. And then the second half is, well, now that I've given you the information about why it's working like this and what you need to do, here's actually active information that you can take action on. Because when I started talking about this Uh uh, to people, they would say, oh, this is great. I love this information. Nobody ever explains this. This is fabulous. Now I know the information about how my body is working or not working in this case. Mm -hmm. But what do I do, right? And I realized that providing actionable information was actually the key to getting people better. (laughs) Yeah. So the second half of the book came out of that realization. Especially if it's tasty, right? Yeah, of course. Well, luckily, you know, I mean, food is delicious. Whole foods are delicious. Yeah. And because of this shift in dietary understanding that's happened in the, in the public Mm -hmm. and in the public sort of medical sphere that, well, we actually do need to eat fats, right? Oh, yes. And we do need we do need saturated fat. We do need polyunsaturated. Like, 
you know, w- with all of these sort of realizations, food is now even better, right? Right, exactly. Because <laughs> let's cook with butter, right? <laughs> or ghee, because oh, yeah. we need to, yeah. right? So, so I, that, that makes everything more delicious. <laughs> exactly. So I, I'm thumbing through your book as we're talking, and on page 130, well, across from page 134 is page 9, and it says, nectarine, pea, broad bean, and spelt salad. I'm going to be making this mm-hmm. this weekend. This looks spectacular, and I have <laughs> fresh peaches. I'm not going to get nectarines. I'm going to get peaches. I have fresh peaches on the tree right now that I'll be able to harvest and and uh, oh, wonderful. put in it. Yeah, so do you have a favorite recipe or two in the book? You know, I do have a favorite recipe, but it isn't for taste. My favorite recipe in the book is actually the bone vinegar. Mm. Mm-hmm. What I realized is that, you know, I mean, I live in Southern California, and it's really green and beautiful, and there's a lot of plants growing everywhere. And I remember growing up, and I, my grandfather was a gardener, and he would go through the garden, and he would just take out most of the plants that were growing there. And he, these were weeds, right? Right. And so we have this con- I grew up with this concept of all of these sort of annoying plants being weeds, including dandelions, right? Uh-huh. And what I realized as I was learning sort of alternative medicine was that these aren't weeds at all, right? These are actually really valuable plants and valuable substances. So I love the idea of this bone building vinegar because you can make it at home yourself. Mm -hmm. It's full of calcium, even though calcium isn't the only goal of of health or, or, or of bones, but it is full of calcium. And it's also full of all of the additional vitamins and minerals and trace, trace minerals and various other factors that you need mm-hmm. in order to have a healthy body. So as soon as you put these herbs into the vinegar, the vinegar releases the minerals and the nutrients in the plants. Yes, of and these course plants, it does. Oh, yeah, these plants are naturally very high in minerals. Mm-hmm. They're, they're concentrated nutrition which is sort of like the way herbs are. They're very flavorful and very dense in, in flavor. They're also very dense in nutrition. They're correlated. Right. So these herbs are very dense in nutrition. And if you put them all into this vinegar, apple cider vinegar certainly is the best, raw mm-hmm. apple cider vinegar with the bacterial component in there. Right. It's going to break down the plant and access all of the nutrition that's in there. And so after six weeks, you have basically a supercharged supplement right wow. and but you didn't go to the store you didn't drive your car to the store you didn't pay for a large corporation to manufacture it right there's no packaging involved right and you did it out of the weeds that are growing naturally where you live and you've made it yourself and so like we were talking about handing the power back to people to take care of themselves right in this way i really like this recipe because it does exactly that yeah It can cost you almost nothing to buy apple cider vinegar. And if you can gather the correct weeds, Mm -hmm. (laughs) quote-unquote, you've got something great that's going to really help sustain your health. Right. Well, I tell people, weeds weeds in gardening, weeds are pioneer species. They show up first, and they do the heavy digging. They're also mining the nutrients out of the soil. Right. So they're, they're densely nutrified. So I'm on page 232 of your book. And I'm kind of getting excited because on your list of ingredients, there's a huge list of herbs that you or weeds or plants that we'd put in here. And I'm going down. All right, I have dandelion growing in the yard. I have stinging nettle growing in the yard occasionally. I've got red clover, uh, mint mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one that I'm really excited about that's a weed that just grows wild here is lamb's quarters. I can do five of these great. out of my yard. Exactly. <laughs> How great is that? Yeah. You know? It's completely sustainable because yeah. the weeds want you to pick them. Yeah. You know, they, they right. want to grow back. So it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful system this yeah. way. Wow, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. That is uh, cool. I'm going to actually make some of this. I was just going to say on top of that recipe, this is kind of interesting, and then we can change the subject. But when I was doing the research for the book and looking into ways of helping people um, intake the nutrients, I found um, that what used to happen with, with vinegars like this, mm-hmm. was that they were used as medicinal cordials. This is in, you know, the 1500s. Oh. And um, so there's a really long history of using this type of situation as a medicine. So there's something called a shrub, 
And what a shrub is is basically a medicinal vinegar with some other sparkling substance in it, maybe a sparkling water or maybe a tea or something like this. Mm -hmm. So you can actually use this vinegar to make a drink, which is kind of delicious. <laughs> uh -huh. So it's not just a matter of, you know, drinking some, some slightly bitter vinegar. You can actually use it to make something good as well. Wow, cool. Well, and, you with, know, a long his with also a long, long history, history of use. Yeah. I've kind of developed a taste for apple cider vinegar. Oh, I have too. Yeah, uh... <laughs> but I know that some people, when I talk to them, they're like, they're like, oh, I don't, I don't like vinegar, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, well, we, but the benefits are so great, and there are ways to yeah. make it. Yeah. So, yeah. Plus, I'm getting ready to harvest probably 150 pounds of apples that I'm going to turn into um, oh, a wow. variety of different things, and I have always have le extra cores left over. So I am going to attempt to make apple cider vinegar of my own this year. What do you do with all those extra apple cores? We make apple cider make vinegar, vinegar out of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. I fail all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we learn. Um, that's, why, that's really why I asked yeah, this question. So. I, I fail all the time. I think that I don't know how to move forward as a human without failure being part of it. Yeah. I planted a bunch of herbs recently, like uh, I planted some basil and I planted some daikon root and I planted some cilantro and I completely failed with growing the cilantro and I have no idea why, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was a total failure. But I don't internalize that because all it means to me is that I need to understand a little bit better how to yeah. do the things I want to do. Yeah. And... I think, I mean, me medicine, you have to be, a, you have to just deal with failure all the time. Oh, and it's yes. not because you're a bad doctor. Mm -hmm. it, there's so many parts, moving parts involved in treating a, another human. Maybe they're not taking their herbs or maybe their, you know, mental state is wrong. Or maybe somebody just died in their family and they can't deal with what you're telling them. So there are so many things involved in yeah. medicine that you have to just be ready to fail all the time and not have it be your fault, right? <laughs> right? right not yeah. take it personally yep, and not exactly. say this, I hate myself because I failed. And this is just a, a mindset for living for me mm -hmm. because it's so much a part of what I do. Yeah. That, And I think also coming out of art and out of creativity, Yes. I mean, you don't look at a great artist's work and say, everything that this artist made is amazing. You usually know this artist for one or two pieces, right? right? Mm -hmm. And the rest of their examples are maybe they're okay or maybe they're terrible. And there's no way to get where you're trying to go without failing as a human. Right. And I feel like if you're not failing a lot, you're not really Learning doing enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And, do more. Uh, yeah, do more. Fail more because then you're going to get further. Yeah. No, I don't know if that exactly answers your question the beautifully. way you were asking. Yeah, but. beautifully answers it. What do you consider your biggest success? My biggest success is every patient, really. Mm. Every, every time somebody comes in and says, thank you, nobody else was able to do this for me, and I know that that person is going to have a better life, that's... That's definitely my greatest success. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. What drives you? I think it's that. I think it's, 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 it's that I have an ability to help people, mm -hmm. and I have an, also have an ability to translate information and be clear about it in ways that people can understand. And I think that there is, this is kind of strange, but I feel some sort of responsibility to to pursue that and to help people understand and to help people clarify. Mm -hmm. There is some drive in there for uh, wanting to help people that's quite pure. So I don't know where that comes from, <laughs> but it does drive me. Yeah. That's, I, you know, I, I wrote a paper in the eighth grade in 1975 on how we were overfishing the oceans. And uh -huh. I don't know to this day where it came from, but it's just there. And it's always been there for me around food. So it, yeah. it's, it's a beautiful thing when we can just, just listen to it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think also that now that we were talking about it a little bit, part of that drive is also like I spoke about what drove me towards medi- this kind of medicine in the first place is mm-hmm. that I can see the place where the the planet is in harmony and humans are in harmony with the planet yep. and the system flows and is, is in a natural dynamic. Mm-hmm. And I, I know intuitively, as it sounds like you do, that this is the sort of proper state, yeah. right, for for the system to function mm-hmm. in in its optimal way. And, it, and that allows everything to be healthy. It allows the planet to be healthy and allows the humans to be healthy. So I can see that and I think you can too. And yeah. That also is a drive. That's a very strong drive because I, I think that, that that's a fight as well. Mm-hmm. So it has to have a drive behind it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm all about education, and I have to know, is there a book that's been influential in this process in your life? There is a really random book which was written by a doctor in maybe like the 70s. Uh-huh. And his name is Robert Becker. And he wrote a couple of books about the body as electricity and oh. what, what we, as electric, be, as beings of electricity, like how, how does that influence our health mm-hmm. and how do we influence the, the functioning of our system through working with the electricity, the body electric, it's called. Oh. So it's, it's to do with, it's sort of how we think, mm-hmm. what we do. It's sort right. of all the basics of, of medicine, like what are, what are the pieces that are involved in creating an optimized system? And that's food, and that's thought process, and that's stress levels, and that's all of these things. So I think that this sort of overview that came out of his thinking definitely influenced how I'm thinking about medicine. Nice. Nice. The body electric. I think there was also yeah. there. I think there was a 1970s science fiction movie called that as well. <laughs> Probably was. Probably. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? So, in terms of fundamental human health, we we know that at the very basis of our functioning is proper nutrition, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, because of the system that we're in. Um, and a lot of the agricultural practices, et cetera, even if you are totally aware and eat five pounds of raw organic vegetables a day, even if you're doing everything optimally, what I find is that people still are deficient. Yeah. And it's really important if you want a long and healthy life to understand what your own personal nutritional deficiencies are. Mm-hmm. And you can do that through a test, which is called a nutrition evaluation. Ooh. So you find out you find out exactly what you don't have. Mm-hmm. The second the second step in optimizing or fe- building this foundation is understanding something which is sort of new to medicine, new to nutritional medicine, mm-hmm. and that is how does your body genetically actually respond to nutrition? Because the genetics of nutrition can vary so greatly between people. Oh right. So you can say we both have a vitamin D test, you, we both come back deficient in vitamin D, mm-hmm. but because you have great genetics, you only need a small amount of supplementation. Maybe you need to sit in the sun for five minutes. I have terrible vitamin D genetics. If I don't take 10,000 a day, my levels drop rapidly. Right. But there's no way to know how to supplement your nutrition, whether it's through whole foods or whether it's through supplements, however you choose. There's no way to know how to treat yourself with this medicine unless you know genetically how you respond to it. So these are the two sides of the coin mm-hmm. of dealing with foundational nutrition from a medical perspective. And both of these tests can be done at home and mailed into labs. You can do it yourself. And from these two pieces of information, you build a really strong foundation for future health. Nice. So the first one was nutrition evaluation. Uh huh. And the second okay. one was. It's a nutritional genetics test. Oh. So you basically spit in a vial, and yep. you come back with information on how your genes work with the nutrition that you're putting into your body. Wow. How do I find? How do I find out about them? I want to do them. 
Well, I'm trying to build an online platform so that all people can start gathering this information for themselves. Uh -huh. Because as we were speaking about people taking care of themselves, especially as things are looking with healthcare in this country, that has to happen. Yes. Um, so I'm looking to build that platform. I'm trying to do it now. But I can certainly send you the information in the meantime. Perfect. And then we can post it on the, on the show notes page Absolutely. as well. Perfect. Absolutely. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Laura. It's been a treat getting thank to you. chat with you. Yeah, it's really nice talking with you too. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? Well medicinethroughfood.com I have a little site there mm -hmm. um, they can link to the to the book website through that um, okay. and I also have a blog which is drlaurakelly.com where I write about random things like this <laughs> <laughs> nice nice and you can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash healthy bones well that's it for today thanks for joining us on the urban farm podcast do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWantToGarden.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.